<laughs> Let's talk a little bit about auto merge. Um, from the history we have with source control, we have all developed different attitudes about how much we can trust auto merge and the correctness thereof. Um, at this particular conference, I would imagine that there are certain attitudes that are underrepresented. Um, but some of the attitudes that exist are things like, I want exclusive locks on every field. I don't trust auto merge. I always want to. I always want to have an exclusive lock. <laughs> like I said, that attitude probably doesn't show up real big here at OSCON, but nonetheless, as an industry, um, there is a certain mistrust of auto merge because if you ask somebody who is involved in a, DV, in a source control tool, they will tell you auto merge isn't perfect. It can't be perfect. One of the things that you you have to adjust your mindset when you talk about merging database data, particularly with template-driven schemas, is that the auto merge can be correct. You, it's correct if you define it to be. Well, I'm going to show you some examples of how we can define a template that tells Veracity how to merge a database, and the resulting merge is as correct as you told it to be. So uh, we can get rid of the mindset that auto merge might fail. Uh, because it is possible to define a template such that it never fails, depending on what you're willing to accept in terms of the merge result. In either case, Veracity keeps a log of all the changes it makes. So when an auto merge happens, Veracity will tell you, hey, I had to do a merge. Two people modified the same field. Here's the one I selected, and here's why. It gives you a log. So last, you know, last resort at least tells you why it did what it did. When you do a merge in database, you've got two problems to solve, basically. You have conflicting changes and you have constraint violations. I'm going to talk about these separately, uh, conflicting changes first. But first, let's mention the non-conflicting changes. These are the ones that we don't really, that, that aren't hard. Two people have a different record, we don't care. Just keep both records, it's great. Uh, two people modify a record, different fields. So if, uh, if you have a, a bug record and two people modify the record and they change they don't change the same field, you can define the template to say, allow that, that's good, we're good with that. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> this is a, uh, another really simple template. We've defined two fields. Think of it as a bug database that has only title and priority. This is a bunch of JavaScript code to create that database. I put it in here only because I wanted the slides to have it. I'm not gonna explain it, but I will point out but at the bottom of this, we add a record, we add a bug. And the bug's title is car stalls, and the priority is low. That's the initial version of the bug. It was logged before they had all the information. Then some new information came up. <laughs> and two people adjusted the database to accommodate the new information. One person wanted to be descriptive, and so he reported that the title of the bug should be the car stalls, and then it explodes. But he didn't change the priority. The other person didn't give any details. He just thought, this is urgent. So he changed the priority. And both of them checked in the change to this bug. And now they need to get merged. What we're going to do is we're going to define a template such that um, veracity, well, as long as you have what we call field level merge, veracity is OK with this. And it will merge the record. This is a, this is a snippet of the resulting record, which shows that both fields were accepted. So. Just walking through a simple example of a non-conflicting change. A conflicting change. Two people modify the same record and the same field. Here's where the template gets really helpful because you can specify how you want these things to be resolved. Here's a template that says, whatever happens, just take the least recent one or the latest one. This is how Fossil works. So if you want to configure uh, your, your template to work the way Fossil does, you do this. This is one that says, um, if two people modify the same integer field, just take the higher value. Uh, this might be the rule you want. That's what, that's what templates are for. You can adapt it for all kinds of situations. This one happens to be really simple. Um, if your field is, an, is a work estimate, for example, maybe you just want the higher one. Maybe you don't want to put any more thought into it. So you can define a template that says that. Here's a template that says, when uh, two people disagree about the severity of a bug, the QA guy wins. <laughs> so you can have templates which resolve merges based on roles if you want. 
And what veracity gives you is a whole bunch of ways of specifying how you want the resolution of a change to be resolved. Um, I'm, I'm not covering all of them, I'm just giving you some examples of how, how we approach this. Yes. Uh, you'll probably use this later in the talk, but to what extent are these records and templates being defined by enterprise customers, and to what, uh, to what extent are they just implementation details of a product that you provide? Uh, the question was, to what extent are these being defined by enterprise customers, or, or are they just answer. implementation details? Um, the answer to that is, we're not far enough along to give a really great answer. Um, there is a fair amount of stuff in Veracity's design and architecture oriented towards the idea that people will change these templates themselves. They are, uh, they are in JSON, they are in the <coughs> database, they're not hard-coded, you can change them. Um, also, however, we understand that they're going to be hard enough to change that a lot of people won't do it. So, I mean, in terms of how that actually fleshes out in practice, I can't say I know the answer. We're designing for, for the case where they can be changed by users. Are the templates themselves versioned like the rest of the objects in the database? Yes, they are. And what happens when you've got two people with different resolvers on two different replicas? question was, are the templates versioned, and what happens if two people change the template? That's kind of what you said. And then run for a while before they actually talk directly to each other. Right. Um, the, the answer is yes, the templates are versioned. Um, the, the way the model works is that all the records have to comply with the template in the change set that they're in. Um, how do we handle conflicts when the template has diverged? Um, Currently, I don't have a, I, I don't have time to explain that in great detail, and I'll be honest. Some of the some of the answers I would have would be a little weaselish. Um, there's some really hard problems there that we're still solving. So. Okay, let's talk a bit about the other kind of change that can go wrong in a, in a decentralized database. I'm still doing fine on time. Uh, the other change is that um, you don't have a conflict in the data that was changed but two changes introduced a constraint violation of some kind. Zing as a database does not support a lot of constraints. It's not designed to, but one of the constraints it does support is unique. You, you want to be able to have fields that are unique. And if you have that, you have problems when two people have the same field. Um, uniqueness in a distributed system is a classic problem. Uh, it's the, usually the way you get uniqueness is you have some central authority that knows if it's unique or not, because it has a list. Um, in this case, thanks. Um, one of the major solutions to this, of course, is GUIDs. You know, we have globally unique identifiers or universally unique identifiers, whichever you want to call them. And that's one of the ways that you end up with uniqueness in a distributed system. Uh, we actually use um, a format internal to veracity of GUIDs where we take a class one UUID and a class four UUID. Have I got that right, Jeff? Yeah, Jeff's in the back. And we concatenate them and then we stick a G in front of it. <laughs> so just in case one of them clashes, you have two different kinds of uniqueness. So in order to get a clash, you need like the ultimate confluence of situations. Anyway, um, that's an example of one of our unique IDs. And let's just say that's not an appropriate bug ID. These are not user-friendly IDs. No one wants to go to a meeting or to a daily stand-up and say, hey, uh, did you happen to check out bug G6C0AE12907D4? You know, <laughs> it's just not a friendly ID. So one of the challenges to be solved by a system like this is that bugs probably need IDs that are friendly, but fun, friendlier than that. Uh, this is the way in Veracity that you just, you tell Veracity you want a field to be unique. It's just a, it's a simple constraint. Another example of a very simple template snippet. And the way that you get Veracity to enforce and fix uniqueness on merge is that you can specify something that we call uniqueify. And this is, the basic concept here is on merge, if a merge results in a constraint violation on a unique constraint, you can tell Veracity to modify one of the records, and you can tell it how you want to do it. So in this case, and the, the two answers that you have to give are, which one do you modify, and how do you modify it? 
there again, the, whatever it does will be logged. So um, it's a matter of just defining how you want your template to solve the problem. Here's one, just as an example, and not necessarily a useful one, where we have a field called val that is of type integer. It's required to be unique, and on merge, if they find a constraint violation, we will take the last modified value, the latest value, and we will add five to it. That's just one way of solving the problem. What we're doing in the process as we develop veracities, we're adding more and more of these ways to, to uniquify values so that we can handle a broader range of cases for merge. Um, but what it comes down to is that we don't want to just uniquify values. We want to have a decent chance of generating values that are unique and friendly without having to uniquify them later. And so an ounce of prevention here helps a lot. If you can, um, if you can have ways of generating values that you don't have to change. So uh, we've got a, a few things that we're developing here. I'm going to give an example of one. One of them is that if you were to say, let's you know, we want bug IDs that are friendlier. Um, let's give every user, because Veracity has user accounts, let's give every user a user prefix. And uh, we'll just generate bug IDs that start with their user prefix and have digits. And we'll just increment the digits. And that way, at the very least, we know that um, if, if two people are going to have a, a unique constraint violation because they both added the same bug ID, it's going to be the same person. So my user prefix might be E. And so I generate, my first bug will be E0001, and my next bug will be E0002. And, um, so all I'm saying here is it gives us a way of hoping that the, uh, that the constraint violation isn't going to kick in. What that looks like in a template is this. The value uh, ID is specified as unique. Um, it has a default function value of gen user prefix of unique, which is which generates those uh, strings that I just described. And then on merge, we have an operation called ink digits end. So uh, what will happen is that if I enter the same value in two places, uh, one of them will be changed and it'll get a different bug ID. So there again, these are just examples of how these kinds of problems are going to be solved. Um, some of this is still what we would call experimental. So we're, we're looking, for, uh, looking for good answers to the, the kinds of problems that we've got.